Hello, friends, and welcome to our weekly Bible study. We're so grateful that you can join us in this way online, but I want to invite and encourage you to come and join us in person every Monday night at St. Timothy Catholic Church in Laguna Niguel, California. You're welcome to be with us from 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. in the hall as we dive into the gospel reading for that upcoming Sunday liturgy. We hope that you can join us, but as you're participating here online, please know that you are still part of our community. We love you. And as you're here, please like this video and leave a comment with any questions or reflections or just to say hello, because likes and comments tell YouTube that you like this video and it might recommend it to more people. And we want to get more people engaged in the Word of God and to know about the love that God has for them. Please also make sure you subscribe to our channel so that you are notified anytime we have a new video, not only Bible study, but we do many other things that we would love for you to enjoy and participate in. But without further ado, thank you for being with us. God bless you and enjoy the recording of this week's Monday Night Bible Study. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. We praise you and thank you, Lord Jesus, for the gift of this community, the gift of this time together. And we lift this study up to you, Lord, that your will would be done during this time and in each one of our lives. We ask that you remove any distractions, worries, doubts, exhaustion, tiredness, anything drawing our attention and focus away from this time in your word, and that you would help us to know that you are with us. Make your presence known to each one of us in a unique and personal way. Speak to each one of us in a unique and personal way. And as we dive into your word tonight, Lord, we pray that we would be receptive to your Holy Spirit as you are moving and speaking in this place, and that you would guide us just deeper and deeper in relationship with you and with one another. Thank you for the gift of this time. and Challenge us, comfort us, whatever it is we are seeking or looking for. Help us to remember that all of our human desires, every longing in our heart can only be ultimately fulfilled by you. And so we come before you tonight seeking, open, desiring to be receptive to whatever you have in store. So let your will be done, Lord. We pray all of these things in your most precious name, Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome once again. We are in Mark chapter 3, verses 20 through 35. A little bit of a longer section this evening. Uh, now that we're back in ordinary time, this upcoming Sunday is the uh, 10th, I believe. Uh, yes, 10th Sunday in ordinary time. We are now out of the uh, Easter and Pentecost season. Um, and out of the special feast days like Holy Trinity and Corpus Christi, and now we're just back in the cycle of readings of Ordinary Time. And because we're in cycle B, we're in the Gospel of Mark. So we're kind of going back toward the beginning of the Gospel and the rest of these weeks of Ordinary Time leading up to uh, this coming Advent in fall, we'll just be slowly working our way through the Gospel of Mark, okay? So where we're reading tonight is toward the beginning of Jesus's public ministry. He's already called some disciples to follow him. He's done some miracles and some healings. He's healed a leper. He's healed a paralytic. He's already had some conflicts with the Pharisees. Remember that the Gospel of Mark is very like boom, boom, boom. This happened, this happened, this happened. Presenting Jesus as this, uh, the symbol of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark is the lion. He is someone who has power over sin and death. And so we'll see that kind of displayed as we go through the Gospel of Mark. And so there's other things that may come up that are unique to Mark, but uh, that's just some things to keep in mind as we read this tonight. So that's where Jesus is. Beginning of his ministry, he's done a few things. Hello. Um, and um, sorry, the Bible cart moved mysteriously. Um, and done a few things um, in his ministry. And he is in Capernaum which is in the uh, northern region of Israel around the Sea of Galilee. It's a coastal city. That's where this takes place. Okay, so we're in Mark chapter 3, starting in verse 20, and we'll read through verse 35. First time through, just get a picture for what's happening. Mark 3, 20. Jesus came home. Again, the crowd gathered, making it impossible for them to even eat. When his relatives heard of this, they set out to seize him. For they said, he is out of his mind. The scribes who had come from Jerusalem said, he is possessed by Beelzebub, 
and by the prince of demons he drives out demons. Summoning them, Jesus began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. That is the end of him. But no one can enter a strong man's house to plunder his property unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can plunder his house. Amen, I say to you, all sins and all blasphemies that people utter will be forgiven them. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an everlasting sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Jesus' mother and his brothers arrived, standing outside. They sent word to him and called him. A crowd seated around him told him, Your mother and your brothers and your sisters are outside asking for you. But he said to them in reply, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking around at those seated in the circle, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Confused? <laughs> this is not an often read section of the Gospel of Mark, so I'm sure we'll have many questions. But now that you get a sense for what's been said, we're going to pray through this passage a little more intentionally. we read it one more time through. And I invite you, now that you know what's going on, see if there's any particular word or phrase that just resonates with you personally as we read this. It doesn't have to have any you know, meaning as to the theological interpretation of the text, but just a word strikes you, maybe reminds you of something going on in your own life. In some way, the Lord is speaking through it to you. Make note of whatever that is. Begin to reflect on it. Why is this standing out? What is the Lord saying directly to me personally through this passage? Okay, so we'll do that the second and final time through. Mark chapter 3, verse 20. Jesus came home. Again, the crowd gathered, making it impossible for them to even eat. When his relatives heard of this, they set out to seize him, for they said, He is out of his mind. The scribes who had come from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he drives out demons. Summoning them, he began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. That is the end of him. But no one can enter a strong man's house to plunder his property unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can plunder his house. Amen, I say to you, all sins and all blasphemies that people utter will be forgiven them. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an everlasting sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. His mother and his brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent word to him and called him. A crowd seated around him told him, your mother and your brothers and your sisters are outside asking for you. But he said to them in reply, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking around at those seated in the circle, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So I invite you to take a few moments to look over this passage and the things that stood out to you as well as any questions that you have. If you're watching or listening to this later, please let us know, however you're doing that, what stood out to you. But for those of us here, we'll then take about the next 10 or 15 minutes. And with those you're seated with, feel free to join another table if you're at a smaller one, if you like. Um, but we'll take about the next 10 or 15 minutes to share what stood out to you and why, and or what questions do you have about this passage. And then we'll bring it back to the larger group for some teaching and some Q&A. Okay, so take about the next 10 or 15 minutes to discuss with those around you. 
so uh, there's a lot of things in this passage, right? A lot of things that are uh, difficult to understand, that are odd. Um, so let me paint a little bit of a context, um, as I usually hope to do, and then we can open it up for some questions. Um, a reminder, in the Gospel of Mark, this is the first gospel written, and it was written predominantly to Christians in Rome who were under Roman rule who had an emperor, who had a king, you know, in a sense. And the writer, John Mark, the, um, the follower and disciple of Paul and Peter, he is writing this to show that Jesus is the true king. And as a king, he is going out to fight against the forces of evil. He's on the offensive. That's why the symbol for Mark is the lion. If you've ever been to um, St. Mark's in Venice, you know, it has those lions right above it. Um, you know, to symbolize that and beautiful mosaics inside depicting those same things to, to show that Jesus is this forceful, like very heroic savior and Messiah, not just coming to guard us against evil. No, he's going out to attack evil on our behalf. And so even at the very beginning of this gospel, he's already gone out to drive out demons, to do these healings, some of which are on the Sabbath that are already drawing this response. And so the reason why this weird division and questioning is happening so early is because if you take a stand against sin, a definitive stand against sin, against the ways of the world, against the status quo, people will respond. People will notice, and some will like it, and some will not. And at Jesus' time, a lot of them didn't like it. And so you'll see throughout, like, there are people even who are directly opposed to one another. The Pharisees, who did not like Herod and did not like Rome, and the Herodians, who loved Herod and loved Rome, both hate Jesus. They, they disagree on everything else, and yet they can agree on the fact that we don't like what this Jesus person is saying. Because if you take a stand for your faith, you need to expect that persecution will come. Jesus himself says, if the world does not hate you, it's because you're essentially not living in relationship with me. Because if, if I have chosen you out of this world, then the world will hate you because of me. It says that in John 15. The world will hate you because of me. And so this really is a reminder to us. Like if you're living the Christian life and nobody has made any kind of stink about it, sorry, but you're probably not really living the Christian life. At least not loudly enough. Like, you know, and we're not meant to do it to aggrandize ourselves or glorify ourselves, but if we're not taking part in that mission to go and spread the gospel, like, and nobody even knows, like, nobody could pick us out of a lineup if they were asked to pick the Catholic in the line. Like, if nobody has any idea, then what are we doing? How seriously are we taking that mission? Because Jesus himself is proof that if you take a stand, people will take notice and they will not understand. All these different responses to Jesus very early. There's responses of distrust, of accusation, of confusion, or even a desire to control Jesus. And how many times have you approached God in prayer, or have I approached God in prayer with one of those dispositions? God, I'm not sure that I can trust you. You're not delivering on my plans and my expectations for my life. So are you doing anything at all? Or these bad things happen in my life, so this is your fault, God. This is your doing. Accusation. Or God, I have no idea what you're doing. I don't know what to do. I'm immobilized. I'm so narrowly focused on what I thought was going to happen, I can't do anything. Confusion. Or God, if you would just do this, if you would just act in this way, then everything would be so great. Control. So the same responses people are having to Jesus are often the responses we still have for him. And so this is a very, even though it's confusing, it is a very reflective kind of passage. It shines a mirror onto the way that we are in relationship with Jesus. And whether or not we are approaching him with the trust in his power, in his providence that we are meant to approach him with. The first reading for this upcoming Sunday comes from Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, the chapter about the fall and the consequences of the fall, to show us that sin brings division, and doubt, and all of those things. Confusion, accusation, a desire to control. And we see that then borne out in the related gospel that we'll hear this Sunday that we just read. That is the effect of sin. 
And so it's a very interesting parallel that happens here. There's one kind of interesting place in, um, in 2 Kings. And what's interesting is that the accusation that's made here from the scribes against Jesus in verse 22 says he is possessed by Beelzebul. Okay, that can be translated a couple different ways. It can be translated as the Lord of the Flies, um, not the book, um, but it's one of the pagan kind of Canaanite deities um, or, or Philistine deities, or it can be um, uh, Prince of Baal, which Baal was a Canaanite deity. And so either way, they're trying to align him with one of these false pagan deities and saying they're doing these things by this deity's power. But what's very interesting is, is before this, in chapter 2, there's the scene where Jesus is in the home and the people want to bring their friend, the paralytic, to Jesus, and they can't get to him. So what do they do? They rip a hole in the ceiling and they drop him through the ceiling. Okay, That happens before this in chapter 2. Then right now in chapter 3, he's being accused of being in line with Beelzebul. That's important because in 2 Kings chapter 1, listen to these first few verses. After Ahab's death, who was the king of, Mo, of uh, Moab, Moabite, the Moabites, Moab rebelled against Israel. Ahaziah fell through the lattice of his roof terrace at Samaria, like the paralytic, and was injured. So he sent out messengers with the instructions, go and inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, which is the Philistine territory, whether I shall recover from this injury. And this is exactly where Elijah first appears, the prophet, the one who is meant to then represent the future John the Baptist. Isn't that interesting how those things happen? And a compact span of the very next verse says, meanwhile, the messenger of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, that's the first time we ever hear his name. And so these, these compact events of the New Testament, the appearance of the new Elijah, John the Baptist, someone falling through the roof to be healed, Mark chapter 2, and then the accusation in the name of Beelzebub all happened in the first three verses of this to show that when you look as you as a king, this is King Ahaziah, if you look to evil authorities, the presence of Satan, the enemy, the pagan religions, if you look to them for hope, sin is only going to bring division and destruction. And so Mark parallels these exact same events to show this is the proper way to seek healing from the true king. And even if you are a king yourself, you still need the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, to heal you. Such an interesting parallel between those, those two sections. And ancient, you know, 2 Kings takes place, you know, a thousand years before Jesus. And yet the events are a direct parallel to these events of the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. So invoking that, Beelzebub, that's one of the only other places in Scripture we see that name, is in 2 Kings chapter 1. Showing again, sin brings division. This passage is what's called an intercalation. An intercalation is where there is the beginning of a story, something else is interjected, and then there's the end of that story. A very famous one that is present in many of the Gospels is the story of Jairus' daughter and the hemorrhaging woman, right? Someone comes to Jesus and says, uh, Jairus comes to Jesus or his servants say, uh, you know, my daughter is dead, um, you know, or my daughter is lying ill, come help her. And then on the way, Jesus encounters the hemorrhaging woman who reaches out, touches the tassel of his garment, and she's healed. And then you get cut back to Jairus, and they get there, and she's died. And Jesus is like, it's all good, and he raises her from the dead. You know, that paraphrasing, obviously. He doesn't say it's all good, but essentially, you get the idea. But that's an intercalation, right? Beginning of a story, something else happens, end of the story. But the two are related, okay? Jairus' daughter was 12 years old. The hemorrhaging woman was suffering from a hemorrhage for 12 years. It's about this restoration of these numbers 12 in the Old Testament that represented the 12 tribes of Israel that had been dis dispersed, and that Jesus is going to make new and whole what sin has destroyed. And here, the same thing is happening. At the beginning, what do we have? A recognition of he's home, and his relatives come and say that he's out of his mind. Then we have this intercalation of him explaining these parables, and then there is the aftermath of what the family does when they see Jesus. And so Jesus is sandwiching this, or Mark is presenting it in this way, to show that the division in his family can very much also be explained by the ironic division that would be present if he were doing these things in the name of Satan. He's using this parable to kind of speak against the division of those who do not believe in who he truly is. Speaking against the accusation, but also speaking against the division. 
Okay, so it's that same type of passage using that parable as an example to illuminate what's happening around it. There's this uh, famous passage, or not, I wouldn't call it famous, everything in the Bible is famous, but there's this uh, notable passage, I should say, that's always very difficult for people when they read it. Um, and that's in, in Matthew chapter 10, when Jesus says in, uh, in verse 34, Do not think that I have come to bring peace upon the earth. I have come to bring not peace, but the sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's enemies will be those of his household. You're like, what the heck, Jesus? I thought you were the Prince of Peace. That doesn't make any sense. What are you doing? What he's saying here, based on the things that are also happening around that passage, is that when you respond to Jesus, it's going to bring division. That you can't love your family more than you love Jesus. You can't. If you love Jesus, it will help you love your family even better. But if that becomes an idol and your whole life is seeking to serve those people around you instead of seeking to serve Jesus, eventually that will lead you astray. And that when you love Jesus, many of you know this in your own story, people within your own family don't understand. They turn away. They say very hateful or abusive things toward you or the church because of it, or they misunderstand. And that can be very painful. It can bring a lot of heartache. And I pray that you will not be wounded by this passage further, but be comforted by the fact that Jesus understands that himself. And he's telling you like that, yeah, that will happen. That will happen when you say a 100% definitive yes to the Lord, because it will challenge other people to see, wow, that person's living their life differently. And when other people are challenged, they either respond by saying, I should probably change too, which usually is the rarer thing that happens, or they will become very insecure and they'll start to lash out. Instead of me changing my life, I need to tell them why what they're doing is wrong. And many of us have probably experienced that. And so Jesus here is showing an example from his very own life. He completely cuts apart the accusation, but then he speaks to why the division in his family doesn't matter. Because it's those who are closest to him that are his true family. Because pursuing the Lord is number one. And when we do that, it can help us serve and love those around us even better. Question will inevitably arise in this passage about, okay, who are the brothers and sisters of Jesus, right? Mary was a perpetual virgin, right? Why does it say they're brothers and sisters of Jesus? The word for brothers and sisters in Greek is adelpho. Adelphos is male, adelphe is female, uh, or adelphoi is plural for either. And it does not mean blood brother or blood sister. It means relative or kin. It's a translation of the Hebrew word yah which is someone who is your kin or your kindred. And so the same word is used in Genesis chapter 13, talking about Abram and Lot. They're called brothers or kindred here, but they were uncle and nephew. We see that earlier in the passage. We see their direct relation. It's used other places in the Old Testament. The Gospel of Mark is the only place in Scripture where Jesus is called the son of Mary, which is very unusual. Yes, Joseph may have died by that time, but he would still be called by his father's name unless... His father had children with two different women. And this was something that was believed very early in church tradition, that Joseph had previously been married, he had had older children, and then his wife died, and that Mary had committed herself to the temple as a consecrated virgin. And to be entrusted to the care of a holy individual, Joseph came forward to provide for Mary and to protect her in her purity, to keep her sacred, because she had made this vow to the Lord. And so Joseph would have been a little older. It would have been clear that this was their relationship. It would have made sense that they would have had a perpetually virginal relationship with one another, but he was caring for her. And then when Jesus was born, he would be referred to as the son of Mary to distinguish him from the potential half-siblings of Joseph. And Joseph had these with another uh, individual. That's one theory. These could also be just older cousins very easily to explain older cousins. And the reason we know that they have to be older, it would have been very inappropriate for a younger sibling in a culture that valued elders to come forward and tell an elder relative that they were doing something wrong or to accuse them in this way. It would have been unheard of for this to happen. That's why in the Old Testament, the punishment for a rebellious son is to take them to the gate of the city and stone them to death. 
okay? Just for being rebellious, okay? You didn't have to do anything in particular. Just talk back, I don't know, you know, it's, I guess it's up to the definition of the people there. But to be a rebellious son, that's how seriously they took the fact that you respect your elders. And so we know from this context, they're coming out in accusation against Jesus. They must be older. So it would make no sense that they were born after Jesus to threaten Mary's perpetual virginity, but that they must have been either older siblings of Joseph from a previous marriage or older relatives. That would be called kindred, which can translate to the word that's used for, it can also be translated as brother. So when St. Jerome in the fourth century translated the Bible into Latin, he used the word brothers. He used uh, the equivalent word in Latin. And some of the other church fathers that came up to him and they said, you know, you really shouldn't use this word. It's going to confuse people. And St. Jerome basically said, like, how could anyone possibly think that Mary had other siblings? Like, it's ridiculous. Like, there's no reason for me to change this. It's more of an accurate translation. I'm not going to change this to accommodate something that nobody thinks. And now that very thing is something that people accuse, you know, in their own biblical interpretation of. So if that question is coming up for you, who are these people? Hopefully that answers that question. But I think the more important question um, is related to the things that I, I posed earlier. And that is, am I living my faith in such a way that demands a response? Am I living my faith in such a way that demands a response? Now, I'm not telling you to go out to a foreign nation and be like, come on, persecute me. I'm Catholic. Like, get over here. You know, you don't have to go be a glutton for it. But if no one in your life could pick you out of a Catholic lineup, if you were accused of being a Catholic in a court of law and there would not be enough evidence to convict you, then there's a problem. There's a problem. Because we're not living our faith out loud enough to be faithful to the missionary call of our baptism, to go out into the world and be representatives of Christ. That's the challenge, I think, in this passage. To recognize it will bring division because it will call to light the sin that exists around us and in our own lives. And people will respond in various ways. But not everyone will be happy about it. And that's okay. Jesus here is telling us, you have a Savior who understands that division even within his own family. So I am with you in the midst of it. But it is not an excuse to get quiet or comfortable. It doesn't mean that we're aggressive and we're mean and we're self-righteous but it means that we do not shy away from living out our faith unapologetically. We do not shy away from defending the faith when it's misunderstood or accusations are levied against it that are untrue. And we do not shy away from opportunities to explain the faith to those who are curious or who are seeking or who misunderstand, but to do it with love and gentleness and reverence, as scripture says. So that's enough for me. Questions? Reflections? What things stood out to you? What questions do you have? Yes, John. I, I hate to ask this, but how is Mary a perpetual virgin after she's given birth to Jesus? How is Mary a perpetual virgin after she gave birth to Jesus? So that term implies that she never entered into the sexual act. That's what the term perpetual virginity means. So it's not a biological reality. It's more of like a um, conceptual reality. Like she didn't conceive in the ordinate biological way. It was something supernatural happened. Yeah, great question. Yeah, Rich. So when you're looking at uh, verse 29, yes. the last thing against the Holy Spirit will never have forgiveness. Oh, yes. Thank you for asking that. That's the other big question. Yes. Everyone's like, okay, so I'm going to say what this is, and then we're all going to raise our hand and see if we have the unforgivable sin. Are you ready? No, I'm just kidding. Um, so there's a couple different ways to interpret this, but the, the catechism actually explains this. Catechism explains this in paragraph 1864. And the Catechism essentially says, it quotes this passage and says that um, anyone who comes forward to God for forgiveness and repents of their sin will be forgiven. But the only sin that cannot be forgiven, one that could be called the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, is the sin that we do not ask forgiveness for. Because a blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is a rejection of the voice within us that, telling, that is telling us that Jesus is Lord and Savior. Scripture says no one can say that Jesus is Lord without the Holy Spirit. That's in 1 Corinthians 12, I believe. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 12, 3. No one can say that Jesus is Lord without the Holy Spirit. So if we reject the opportunity for Jesus to save us, we're blaspheming against the very responsibility the Holy Spirit has within us to well up that recognition, Jesus is my Savior. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that converts hearts. 
And so if we reject Jesus and we don't come to him for forgiveness, we're staying obstinate in our sin. We are choosing to hold on to our sin. We are not coming forward for forgiveness. There is absolutely no account in all of scripture of someone coming forward, repenting and seeking forgiveness that is done unsuccessfully. Every single one of them who comes forward and repents and seeks forgiveness is forgiven. And so logically, we have to deduce that the only sin that is unforgivable is the one that we do not ask forgiveness for. So that's explicitly stated in the Catechism, paragraph 1864. Great question. Because blasphemy actually in the Old Testament in Leviticus 24 is a punishable a capital offense, punishable by death. If you blaspheme against the name of the Lord, you say the name of the Lord in a blasphemous way, you could be stoned to death. And so Jesus, in a sense, is redeeming even that. He's saying anything is forgivable, except those who do not abide by what the Holy Spirit is trying to do in their life, which is to convert you to a recognition that Jesus is your Savior. And so if you don't go to Jesus for forgiveness, if you don't ask for forgiveness, your sin cannot be forgiven. But if you ask, it will be. Yes? Can you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit unknowingly? No. You cannot blaspheme against the Holy Spirit unknowingly. Because you would have to knowingly know who Jesus is and knowingly reject him. Knowingly reject the desire for forgiveness. Now you could do it, let's say, lazily by knowing that you're in a state of serious sin and deciding, you know, I'm just not going to go to confession for a while. I don't feel like it. But you know that you need to. And you know that that sin is serious and separates you from God. Then you would be kind of lazily putting yourself in that position where you're not coming forward soon enough for forgiveness, that if something were to happen to you, your soul might be in jeopardy. However, no one just accidentally commits blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. People who don't know who Jesus is, people who don't have the awareness of that revelation, you know, they're not going to be held accountable to that level of truth. You know, being part of the Catholic faith and the Catholic Church, we believe we have the fullness of truth, and with that comes the fullness of responsibility. We have the highest bar to live up to, and it's a, it's a burden of responsibility. But it's also a bounty of grace. Like, why would we not want all of the truth and all of the knowledge. And so, yes, like we're going to be judged according to a higher bar than others who do not know as much, who have not experienced the depth of the revelation that we have, but we also get access to the bountiful graces of the sacraments and the beauty of what Jesus Christ offers us. And so, I mean, the trade-off is immeasurably in our favor in terms of grace over the burden of responsibility. Yeah? Matt, is that also what we say if somebody was raised Catholic and then refute, you know, basically says God does not exist. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm an atheist now. You're basically refuting the Holy Spirit. talking bad about the Holy Spirit. You're saying, no, you don't exist. I don't, I don't, yeah. I, I don't, I don't believe in you. Yeah. And so you're, hey, you're basically. Yeah. So if someone was raised Catholic and then formally rejected God and said they were an atheist, Yes, they would probably fall under this category depending on the level of awareness they had. Because if they're raised with like a, you know, a, a five-year-old level of knowledge, and that's what they're basing their judgment on, then maybe they didn't learn enough. So they're going to be judged according to that. And if they're rejecting that because it's a misunderstanding or not deep enough, they're not going to be held to the same standard, right? So that's going to be taken into account. Only the Lord and that person knows, you know, ultimately. We can't make that judgment upon anyone else. But essentially, that's, that's how they would be judged. But it's knowingly and obstinately rejecting the Lord, not seeking his forgiveness. Yeah? Uh, so you can't recall in this time, but why does the beginning say, like, they would have no community to eat? And he could have just said, like, they just couldn't stand next to each other very well. Like, yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. Why does it say in the beginning that they didn't have room to eat? I've never thought about this before, but an answer just came to me, so we'll see if it makes sense to you. Um, at this time, table fellowship was a way of extending a family-level relationship to someone else. Hospitality was huge in this culture, so to share a meal around table was something very sacred and very expected in the high, high honor to hospitality that they had in this culture. So to say, to make that note that they didn't even have any room to eat kind of implies they didn't have any room for real fellowship. They didn't have any room for, essentially, family, which then directly relates to what happens, that there's division. Family comes forward, not in a communal way, but in an accusatory way. So thank you for that question. I've never noticed that detail before, but it totally relates to, you know, the division that comes right after. Yeah, Marianne. Did you eliminate his, like, um, strong person? Yes. 
What verse is this? Um, when Jesus is speaking in parables, verse 27. No one can enter a strong man's house to plunder his property unless he first ties up the strong man. There's a couple different ways to interpret this, um, but the, the predominant one among biblical scholars, and my favorite one, is that the strong man is Satan. You cannot go up against someone, those who he's driving demons out of, unless you bind up the strong man. So if Satan is dwelling in someone, you cannot help them. You cannot do anything for them unless you take care of that. And then you can plunder, meaning what is inside now becomes yours. So until sin, the presence of Satan, the enemy, whatever it is, is rooted out of us, Jesus is essentially saying, there's not much I can do. That's why it relates directly to this next part where he says, if you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, if you hold on to your sin, if you leave that in your house, if you're holding on to the strong man or the strong presence of sin within you, I can't come in and plunder what is mine. I can't own your soul in the way that I'm supposed to. I can't, I can't befriend you and forgive you in the way that you desire. So that, that's the, my favorite interpretation of that. Yeah. And others, it's just a parallel for like, if you want to go in and clean something out, you got to get rid of the strong person in there, you know, but it doesn't seem like Jesus is one to advocate for robbery. So, you know, I, I tend not toward that interpretation. Yes. Yeah, so th that's relating to the fact that Jesus is saying whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never have forgiveness. So he's using that as an example for these people who are there accusing him. They are currently, in a way, guilty of that. Because they're saying to him, he has an unclean spirit. So he's talking about the Pharisees. If you're not acknowledging Jesus as Savior, then he can't forgive your sins. So by the fact that they're saying he has an unclean spirit, they're committing that blasphemy by saying, you can't forgive us. You're not who you say you are. Yeah. But yes, to answer your other question, we can absolutely create a clean spirit for ourselves over time through sanctifying grace, through building virtue. Um, that's part of our, our doctrine of justification as Catholics. Our Protestant brothers and sisters, many of them have a doctrine of justification that says that if you just believe you have faith in Jesus and you allow that faith like to take over your life, you are claimed for Christ forever. You know, once saved, always saved. Not every Protestant or evangelical believes this, but it's, it's one of a more predominant viewpoint. Uh, we don't believe that. We do believe that you cannot merit justification. You can't earn salvation. And so that free gift of what Jesus did for us on the cross, yes, you can only just have faith in Jesus and express that faith through baptism to receive salvation. But we also believe in ongoing justification, that throughout your life, you need to be living up to the commitment you've made to the Lord. Just like when I married my wife, I couldn't earn her love. She had to freely offer it to me and vice versa. But then from that point forward, I have to live up to that love and those promises that I've made. So same thing is true for us in salvation. I can't earn what Jesus did for me on the cross, but then that should change my life going forward. And so in an ongoing way, I should be growing in sanctification. The things in me that are unclean should become clean through my participation in the sacraments, good works, building up virtue, things like that. Yes, yeah. I mean, the fruits of the Spirit are evidence that it is happening. Because once you've been baptized, especially confirmed, you have the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. And if you're using them, the fruits are going to pop up in your life. And so that's evidence that you are doing that. Yeah, as long as the fruit is authentic. It's not fake or, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yes? I have a question. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So who is Lucifer, who is Satan, all these different names? Yes. Is it the same person or the seven deadly sins? Like how, can you explain a little bit more about that? Yes. Um, so, who is Lucifer? Who's Beelzebul? Who's Beelzebub? Who's all these? What are all these names? Um, so, a lot of these uh, are either titles of false gods from pagan religions surrounding them. Beelzebul, depending on how you translate it, is either a false god in the Canaanite religion or a false god in the Philistine religion. Um, and as I said, it means Lord of the Flies. Actually, one relation, one translation is Lord of the Dung, because flies fly around dung. So, I mean, I'm, I'm giving you the nicer translation. You can probably guess what the real translation is, um, which I don't know why you have a god of that. That seems really dumb. It should be should have been evidence from the get-go that the Philistines weren't correct, that they have a god for that. But, you know, whatever. Um, 
So uh, Satan is a title. Uh, Satana means the adversary, the enemy. Um, Lucifer comes from a passage in the Old Testament that's usually aligned with the devil because Lucifer means the light bearer. And the light bearer was he who thought himself worthy to bring some light of revelation to humanity. So it's often a title given sometimes for the fallen angel um, of Satan himself, who then converted a third of the angels to become his demons. Um, other demonic names or things associated with demons in the Old Testament, Leviathan, Behemoth, Asmazdeus, there are other false gods or names, simply names of demons that are translated to have something to do with what they do. So the name has to do with what they do. I don't know the direct translations of those, um, but Leviathan is like the great sea serpent, you know, aligned with what Satan did in the garden. Um, behemoth, uh, they think, is either uh, an ancient word for a hippopotamus or like an alligator or something. Um, you know, so just big beasts that represent certain qualities of the enemy or of sin. Um, so, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, they all generally have to do with some way the devil is manifesting. But they're not all, I've seen lists where people in private revelation have said that there are seven demons that correspond to the seven deadly sins. There's really no evidence for that other than someone, someone said it and it's not official church teaching. Um, you can potentially align some based on where they appear in the gospel, but they're very loose correlations. And we don't have a full list, you know, so, and technically there are eight deadly sins, not seven, but, and they don't come from the Bible, they come from... Um, Dante's Inferno, so which is not the Bible. So, yeah, yes. What is the best way to bind the in the devil, like, and so that he collapses? What's the best way to bind the devil? Call a priest. <laughs> priest exorcism. Get him out of there. Um, for us, um, deliverance prayer. Deliverance prayer. Um, now, if you are in a situation, oh, I love when we talk about demonology, you guys. I, I don't want it to freak you out because I, I forgot to say this last time we talked about demons and all of the different levels of demonic activity. I felt it left really heavy, but I was the only one that was really excited because I was excited because every time we talk about the presence of demons, we have to remember how much more powerful Jesus is, that the devil is a puny, tiny wimp who is just a turd. He is the Lord of dung and he sucks and Jesus is way more powerful and he can never overcome Jesus. So I get excited we talk about how to unbind ourselves from the enemy or allow Jesus to do that in us because it just shows how powerless he really is. He only has the power that we give him. Um, so don't be freaked out by any of this, please. Um, it's to further root you in the power of the name of Jesus. Um, so uh, deliverance prayer is essentially speaking out loud the name of Jesus and claiming that name to deliver you from any type of demonic presence. Okay, We cannot perform an exorcism on ourselves uh, but that's for a full-blown possession, which is much rarer. It does happen, but it is much rarer. And there's a formal process in the church to do that. A person who believed they were possessed would have to be willing and desiring to be unpossessed and would have to present themselves to the priest of their local area. So even if like you really love the community here and you found out that someone in your neighborhood was dealing with this and you wanted to bring them here, we would say, what's the church in that area? So if you're in orange, go to the church and go to Holy Family, you know, or whatever it is, and ask that priest. Um, that's kind of that's the way they do it. Um, but for us, simple deliverance prayer, I bind and renounce you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be gone. Um, now, we can only do that in places where we have authority. You only have authority over your own body and then over your spouse and your children. Those are the only levels of authority. And that goes both ways. A wife has authority over husband. A husband has authority over wife in that, uh, over her, his wife in that way. And over both collectively over their children and over their household. You can do it over your own household if you live there. Or even if you're renting, there's, believe me, there's an ecclesial document on exorcism that says if you're renting a home, you still have authority there. It's crazy the ways that we've, the church has figured out all the answers to these questions, okay? But you just, you can claim that. Um, but if you're doing it for someone else, it would be best to walk them through a prayer where they can claim it over themselves or to pray a prayer like this. Jesus, in your goodness, I ask that you deliver this person in your name from oppression or heal this person in your name. Jesus Christ, in your goodness, I ask. And you can do that over yourself as well. But you have a certain level of authority over your own self uh, and your family. Um, so, yeah. And they have to be prayed out loud. You can't say it in your head. Demons can't read your mind. They can infer things that you're thinking, but they can't read your mind. So say it and claim it out loud using the name of Jesus. Yeah. Yes. Does it work like for children over their parents? 
Because it were children over their parents. I don't think they have direct authority, but it would be more authoritative than anyone doing it, you know, because you're in the same family. But just the way that the domestic church, the home, models the hierarchy of the church, um, it wouldn't, you, there wouldn't be direct evidence of that, but it wouldn't hurt. I would, in that case, I would say just use the prayer, Jesus in your goodness, if you grant it, you know, deliver my parents of this or that, you know, because Jesus's authority is more, more over, better than our own. Yeah, Corbin. Uh, I agree with everything you said about the deliverance prayer. Mm -hmm. I think also, like, important to point out that it's only as effective if you're also doing, like, the spiritual life work to live in the state of sanctifying grace. Yes. You know, Thank you for saying that. Actively deny sin. Um, but basically, in a simple answer, live in the state of grace. Yes. You can to remain in that state. Mm -hmm. Because deliverance prayers in itself, and exorcism, priest praying over you, it's not just like a cure-all. You have to yeah. really change your life. It's not a magic spell, yeah. either. Just because you say the right words doesn't mean it's automatically going to work. You have that misconception. Yes. You really have to just yeah, change your whole life for it yeah. to be effective. Yeah. So if you're the one praying for this, uh, especially if you're trying to pray this, like Jesus and your goodness, do this for someone else. Like if you're someone who's doing prayer ministry or something like that, you need to be in a state of grace because otherwise there is a, a obstacle to the Lord's grace working through you. Uh, and the same thing is true in our own life. Like if I want to pray this over my wife or over my children, but I've got a bunch of spiritual junk that's blocking, you know, the, the, the way I need to get right with the Lord. So it's not, this isn't exactly what Corbin said. It's not a cure-all. It's not a magic spell. It's not going to automatically go away. We, act to, we actively have to do the work of repenting of the things that allowed this attachment or this presence of the enemy to come in. Because the enemy can't just go wherever he wants. He needs permission. I don't know if any of you watch, uh, ever watch Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I love Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Um, but uh, in vampire lore, and including in Buffy, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, See who knows this. Um, can a vampire enter your home? No. Only if you invite them in. Only if you invite them in can a vampire enter your home. Now, vampires aren't real, so there you go. But uh, the same thing is true of the enemy. The enemy cannot enter unless you invite them in. Now, we unknowingly invite the enemy in when we participate in things that are overly spiritualized with no protection. Things like Reiki, even practice, certain practices of yoga or mindfulness, uh, astrology, horoscopes, tarot cards, Ouija boards, mediums, fortune tellers, necromancy, any kind of magic or spells, things that we might be fascinated with. But if they don't have protections around them and we really have an unholy curiosity about them, that can open spiritual doorways to allow the enemy to have a foothold in our life and influence that we did not intend. But our intention was given in the curiosity. We opened the door. So if we don't repent of those things, get rid of them, say deliverance prayers to break those chains and then actively root out sin from our life, it's like the passage in the, in the Gospels where it says, um, you know, what happens when someone drives out a demon um, and then they find the house all ordered and clean, like seven demons come back in. Because if you just rearrange everything so everything looks nice, but you don't do the work of emptying completely your life of all these attachments, then sometimes what can happen after can be even worse. Essentially, is what that passage is saying. So um, it's important to be aware of that, too. So thank you for saying that. I appreciate it. Yeah. John. Yeah, going back to the question of the envy and the kind of um, I mean, I, I think, so the Pope Martin in 649 said that, you know, uh, you may conceive without seed, but a Holy Spirit without loss of integrity brought him forth, and after his birth preserved his divinity. And then in, in Vatican II, they mentioned the same thing, similar, they said, um, Etc., etc., etc. Then also at the time of birth, our Lord, who did not diminish his mother's virgin and integrity, also sanctified her. So I, I, I think that it's before, during, and after. Yeah. Because like the behind him is like this traditional mark of the divinity. Sure. So yeah. I, I think like that, um, that helps. Yeah. No, thank you for that. I didn't know that. I wasn't aware of those places where it was quoted. It's like if Jesus can raise somebody from the dead, like, oh, yeah. I'm pretty sure that God can do this. Yeah. And even St. Thomas says it's fitting, but it's not rational. Yeah. It's a miracle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and the, the dogma of the perpetual virginity of Mary is simply that she was a virgin. The details about that, like, yes, there's things that church, the church explicates, but similar to did Mary have uh, birth pangs? 
uh, when she gave birth? Was, did she have pain? And ancient traditions say that she had no pain when she delivered Jesus, but it's not an official teaching of the church. It's just in some writings of church fathers. So the core doctrine is that she just never gave birth to any other children, but there's so many other writings of church fathers, of popes throughout history to ex, like explicate all the little details of that, to show like all the supernatural ways that God made this happen. Um, so it's like very, very cool and important that even these little things have been, you know, spoken. On the point about the exorcism, mm -hmm. you know, there is this, I, I've been taught, like this flow of grace all the way up to the Pope. Mm -hmm. But I, I do want to mention that, like, maybe for us to be, like, when you're in mortal sin, you're cut off, right? Yes. But, like, at Mass, if the priest is a devil worshiper, that still doesn't block the flow. It's because true. It's, it's a very special case. Yeah. Um, that, so it, you know, it's not like the priest has to be you pray for the you hope, of course. Yeah. Yes. But the, there, there should be no doubt that we are receiving the grace is promised, even regardless of our own personal sanctity. Yeah. But, yeah. So it's kind of believing. Yeah, it's in the catechism. It says that sacraments are effective ex opere operato, by the work worked, by simply the priest who has the authority of his ordination saying the right words and using the right things. It will always be valid, even if he is in a complete state of unrepentant mortal sin. That's how powerful the sanctifying grace of Jesus Christ is. Yeah. So we don't get that same luxury because we're not priests. Anybody in the room a priest? I don't think so. So, um, but it gives us confidence in the grace of the sacraments. And then, so that's why, to answer your question, you know, briefly, I said, go to a priest, you know, because they have that access to the authority of God. Um, it is also important to know that that same authority structure exists within the home, that there is a hierarchy, and that the way that the devil seeks to enter the home is through the father. Because the father is technically the spiritual head of his home. Now, it's equally yoked with his wife, but because of the way the domestic church has been revealed theologically, that tends to be the way that the devil attacks. And what do you see in our society? A crisis of masculinity, a crisis of fatherhood, a lot of single parent homes that are children being raised by mothers doing so very capably and beautifully, but you can see how the devil is already at work in this way. And so it's a huge responsibility for us as fathers, for us to pray for our fathers, especially Father's Day coming up, both living and deceased, and to recognize that responsibility. It doesn't mean the authority structure changes in the family of who we can, who has authority to pray for deliverance, but it, it illuminates ways in which that the enemy can work, you know, the ways in which the enemy can work in the family. Yeah, Jonathan, one more thing, and then we'll, we'll close. Mm -hmm. Going back to the gospel, about how the father and the house of God stand, mm -hmm. you know, and the way that you know, how that can be used as a tool for the good. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 100%. That's a total valid interpretation that the strong man could be the head of the household and that when that person is bound, the entire household is susceptible to division and destruction. Yeah, absolutely. We all have a responsibility in some sense. Even if we're not a head of a household, like we all have a responsibility uh, to claim the authority of Jesus Christ over those in our lives, those we love, to pray for them, to pray for our own deliverance and theirs. But back to the point that was made, like it needs to be within the work of really actively repenting from sin. Um, because the devil only has as much power as you give him. And I'll say it again. I'll say it as many times as I live, like or as long as I live. He's a tiny little wimp. He sucks. And I'll say it, you know, and I'm not afraid because I claim Jesus over my life. You know, I mean, he could do whatever he can to me, but he can't do anything to Jesus. And if I claim Jesus over my life, I'm good. And so are you. So have confidence in that. Have confidence in Jesus Christ and in the power of his name and seek to cling to him uh, and repent of your sin uh, because we need to live faiths that are lived out loud in such a way that people respond. Sometimes people respond with distrust, with accusation, with confusion, with a desire to control, just like Jesus. But that doesn't mean it's an excuse for us to get comfortable. The world needs us to stand up against sin. In the same way that Jesus was out on the offensive, we need to recognize the power that we have in his name, to not be afraid, to have courage. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, Jesus, for the gift of this night and the gift of your word. Help us to realize that you are always at work. Help us to realize our need constantly to repent of our own sins and tendency towards sin. 
and to look to you as an example that after powerful moments of teaching and healing, you always withdrew to pray. But when you were accused, you stayed and you fought. You defended yourself. You were courageous and bold in what you came to do. And you have given us every gift. And you, the power of your name and your presence, dwells in us, encouraging us to do the same. To stand up for the faith, even if it's us against the world. That you will equip us to do every good work and with everything we need to be faithful to that mission. So help us not to shy away from it, but to stand up boldly for you as you boldly mounted the cross for us. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of this time together, for this community. Bless us each in the ways we most need it until we gather again. And we pray all these things in your most precious name, Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.